essentially, when is a product or service getting expensive, but you're, it still has enough value that you're willing to consider purchasing it? Mm-hmm. And when is it starting to get you know, sort of too cheap, but there's a discount associated with it, so you're willing to pull the trigger on buying it? Coffee's for closers only. So we've established my proposal is sound in principle. Now we're just haggling over price. <laughs> Let's see how much we're going for on eBay. I mean, it's the same as Dunkin' Donuts. Cost 15 times the price. Welcome to Impact Pricing, the podcast where we discuss pricing, value, and the fascinating relationship between them. I'm Mark Stiving, and today we continue our season of subscription, a series of several podcasts focused on the subscription business model. And at the end of the podcast today, we're going to reveal the winner and the best answers to that question, what is value? I'll also ask another question for a chance to win a copy of my book, Impact Pricing. I'm very excited about our guest today, Peter Zotto. Now, here are three things you really want to know about Peter before we start. He has the understated title of GM at ProfitWell. He is one of the stars of the hit show Pricing Page Teardown, and he's a huge NBA junkie. He used to play at UNH. I guess that's in Durham, New Hampshire. Welcome, Peter. Hey, Mark. Thanks for having me. Great to be here. Pump the chat. I am so looking forward to this. Sweet. Me too. Hey, first, I love watching pricing page teardown. Um, <laughs> you, you guys are awesome. And the editor, whoever does your post-production, does a fantastic job. Thank you. I take zero credit for any of that. We have, a, we have an awesome team. Patrick does a great job. But we have, a, we have a group of about four people who collaborate on making sure that we have the right content, making sure that we have the right post-production, making sure that everything lines up. So I, t- I take no credit outside of just showing up and being there for some comedic relief. Well, I got to say, the quality of those shows are awesome. And, and to the listeners, if you guys are not watching those, you really want to. They are good. Nice. Thank you. One of my recent favorites was the one you guys did, Farmers Only versus Match.com. Mm-hmm. And the reason I love that one is I'm so often telling people you have to focus, you have to focus. And that one just screamed focus. I think one of the things that we talk about, not just with Farmers Only or Match.com, but with a lot of our customers, and I think generally when we talk about subscription pricing or pricing in general, is you want to niche down and focus as much as possible. I think a lot of companies out there, what they try to do is be all things to all people. But when we see either our customers or folks in the market be successful, they're often focusing entirely on one very specific segment or one very specific persona. And so in the case of farmers only, you know, if their their title of their business doesn't give it away, everything that they do is focused on making sure that they they help folks in, you know, sort of in that farming demographic find love or companionship. And that's the only folks that they, that they really focus on. Everybody else, you know, essentially be damned. And so because of that, they are the best at, what they do, and there's not anybody else that's even close. Whereas Match or some of the new ones like Bumble or Tinder, they're sort of, you know, come one, come all, if you will. Right. And I didn't remember the numbers, but I think the willingness to pay in farmers was double that of people that that go to Match. Is that what your memory uh, said? Yeah, I think off the top of my head, I think, I think that's right. And, and again, I think it's because they've done a really good job of identifying who those types of folks are, the personas specifically, and then establishing where, where willingness to pay is aligned with sort of the value that they get out of the app specifically, right? Mm-hmm. Some of the, the core functionality that the, that the app has. Okay. I am really curious about where you guys get some of the data and, and in particular, how it fits with the business model that ProfitWell is running. Can we start with what does ProfitWell do? How do you make money? Yeah, absolutely. Great, great question. So at its core, ProfitWell is a free subscription, a free financial tool for any subscription business. So if you imagine that it plugs into billing systems like Stripe or Recurly or Braintree or Zora or PayPal, we allow subscription businesses, be it SaaS or e or whatever it happens to be, to sort of get a really good understanding of what's happening within the realm of their business. And I'm talking about things like their unit economics to their MRR, their churn, their delinquent churn, their voluntary churn, et cetera. And that's all for free. How we make money are sort of on top of that are one of three ways. We have a, what I would consider a professional services organization in a product called Price Intelligently. Uh, It's sort of the biggest portion of our business where we work with anybody from really large public companies to really small Silicon Valley funded companies on establishing 
what their monetization go-to-market strategy should be. So everything from pricing, packaging, positioning, identifying personas, et cetera, sort of coming up with the right mix of what does a bundled strategy look like for functionality. The other two products are pure products, and one of them is a, is a product called Retain, and what that does is it solves for the problem of delinquent churn. In every SaaS business, uh, you have a number of reasons why customers churn. Uh, about 30 to 40% of the reasons actually revolve around something that we say is, is delinquent uh, or delinquency, and that, that is things like simply a credit card fails for the fact that it expired or somebody's using a debit card in replace of a, of a credit card. So retain what it does is it actually goes out into the world for a particular customer and it recovers that lost revenue because of delinquent churn. Hmm. And then the final product is we have just a one click revenue recognition product called recognize that also makes money for us. So those three products in conjunction work together, but everything on profit well really, and it's, it's pretty much an in-depth product BI and analytics product is totally for free. I got to say that I absolutely love what you guys do in the sense that you're gathering all this information from, from all of these different subscription type companies. And now you can run benchmarks and, and analytics, which is what you, you put together for, for those of us who watch your shows all got the time. It. Yeah, you got it. I think we're, we're, we're lucky in the sense that we're uniquely positioned to have insight into thousands of different subscription companies. Um, and so one of the things that we're able to, to do with that data, of course, it's always anonymized and we don't necessarily look at individual customers, but we can look at aggregate data via benchmarks and see you know, what's working well in the economy, what's not working well in the economy, specifically as it relates to the subscription economy. And that gives us a nice position to when we start to work with companies on their pricing, for instance, you know, have a, have a leg up on, you know, what perhaps the rest of the market is doing and how they can stick out from, you know, aggregate benchmarks that, that's in our data set. Okay, absolutely fabulous. Now I have to get into some nitty gritty. And, and I hope this is helpful for not only my listeners, but, but for your, your viewers as well. For sure. I want to know where you get some of the data that we see on the teardown shows. Um, and, and in particular, just as an obvious to me. And let's start with the easy one. And that's the willingness to pay data. Yeah, sure. So the, there's, there's a couple of things, like maybe some tricks that I can give some of the listeners out there. Uh, price Intelligently, the, the product that ProfitWell has that, that helps companies with their pricing strategies, we have some IP that allows us access to, you know, we talked about farmers only, buyers or, or subscribers. It, it, IP that allows us access to anybody from a, you know, a, a somebody who works on a ranch somewhere in rural Oklahoma or Texas, um, all the way to, you know, for instance, a, a CIO at a Fortune 500 company. And so, we have some relationships with panel providers out there that allow us access to this. And we've built essentially some IP with them that does this in a very quick way. But one of the ways that I think people can do this on their own, if they don't necessarily want to hire a company like ProfitWell is there are great products out there that don't cost a fortune. Some of them are, are companies like askyourtargetmarket.com or AYTM.com that you can go, you can go directly to, you can set up a panel you can identify buyers that fall into some sort of psychographic or demographic cohort that you'd like to identify from. Uh, and then you can ask them a whole series of questions. And so we use tools just like that in order for us to collect data for, for some of our shows. You know, for, for other people that are maybe just getting started and want to, you know, want to collect a sample size that's maybe in the thousands, perhaps, you know, some of the ways that we've see, seen people in the industry out there do it is you can use like a mechanical Turk by Amazon. And so if, if you're not familiar, Mark, with Mechanical Turk or the folks at home who are not familiar with Mechanical Turk, it does what we call human intelligence tasks or HITS. Uh, they are sort of folks that will do a whole bunch of things for you, whether it's clean data to fill out surveys based on their, their psychographic or demographic information. And so if you were looking for a really inexpensive way to collect a bunch of data, Mechanical Turk by Amazon is, is, a, is a super easy way to do it. It's not something that we do very often because... Uh, it takes a lot of segmentation and cleaning to get it right. But if somebody has a lot of time on their hands and are looking for some sort of quick and dirty hits on data, that's a good place to start. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a little advertisement for you then. If we take a step back, we say you guys have access to a panel and mm -hmm. you use that panel to go out and ask about, hey, how much are you willing to pay for something like this? I know you don't ask that question, right. but, <laughs> but, but that's the, what we're trying to find out. Let's say that I were going to hire you price intelligently then you would use your panel to help me figure that out. Uh, it, it's a little bit, so you're, you're not totally wrong, and maybe I did a little bit of disservice here. The, we're not, we don't have a panel specifically, but we have relationships with panel providers essentially throughout the world. Part of what makes the Price Intelligently product sort of special and unique is that we've essentially cultivated these relationships over the past seven years 
And so we've gotten really good at not only identifying what works when, where, and how, but we also have amazing economies of scale. And so if you, know, if you were a, a business today and you wanted to go collect some data and you wanted a panel to do that, you, know, you might retain the services of somebody like Qualtrics.com, for instance, but you're going to pay you know, premium to do that. Whereas the, some of the unique value of Price Intelligently is we have only, not only do we have access to a ton of SaaS data, we have access to these panels and then we can ask a whole bunch of questions to, you know, to drive data set and then take that data, run it through some algorithms we have internally, and then do some analysis and bake in some recommendations on whatever the pricing strategy that a particular company wants or that we see most fit. Yep. That's, that sounds amazing. Well, thank you. Um, now, everybody out there screaming at me right now to ask this question, what do you ask to find out somebody's willingness to pay? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And, and, Willingness to pay is a tricky one, and Mark, I'd love actually your opinion at the end of this, mm-hmm. partly because I think the human brain has a, has a fairly difficult time identifying exactly what number should be when, when it comes time to you know, sort of, hey, how much would you pay for this product? Uh, part of that is we, we, we sort of think in broad strokes, right? So I may not know that the computer that I'm talking to you on is worth exactly $999, but I know theoretically that it's more expensive than the cup of water that's sitting next to it. Right. So it's not really helpful for me or for any of the listeners out there for you to say, hey, when you want to identify pricing, just ask your market or your customers how much they're willing to pay because they're going to give you numbers that are all over the place. And at the end of the day, they're sort of all correct in the way that they think. And so in an effort to, you know, essentially to get closer to the right answer, we use, you know, we have our own version of a, you know, of a modified, what's called a, a, a Van Westendorp price sensitivity meter. But I think for the listeners at home, the easiest way to do this is to ask a series of questions and ranges. What I mean by that is we can start with what price point, excuse me, is a product so expensive that you can't consider purchasing it, regardless of the value that you perceive that it has, all the way down to when is a product so inexpensive that you're actually going to question the quality of that particular product or that service that offering, right? And again, this is something that, we traditionally do as consumers on a daily basis. If we go get food for lunch, for instance, and we walk into a, you know, a small pizza shop and the, the owner says, what do you have? And you say, I'd love a slice of cheese. And he or she says, well, great, that'll be $100. At that point, you're, you're probably not hungry enough to pay $100 for a slice of cheese pizza. Not unless that good at cheese. That's right. <laughs> unless it has you know, sprinkled with gold or something. On the flip side, when you think about, you walk into that very same uh, pizza shop and they say, sure, it's 30 cents. You're probably going to wonder, is it, you know, is it fresh, right? Is this a couple day old pizza they're just trying to get rid of? And so you now have like a, a floor and a ceiling of, of pricing, if you will. And then you start to ask questions around essentially when is a product or service getting expensive, but you're, it still has enough value that you're willing to consider purchasing it. Mm-hmm. And when is it starting to get you know, sort of too cheap, but there's a discount associated with it. So you're willing to pull the trigger on, on buying it. And essentially, you have four, four data points now, right? And you, know, you can use some, some tools in Excel that allow you to essentially graph this out. So you have four intersecting lines, and you want to look at something called an indifference price point. And I'm sure, Mark, you've either thought about this, or, and I'd love your opinion here, but that's, sort of, that's how we start to think about pricing. I'm sitting here picturing the four lines in my head because I know this exceptionally well. Yep. But for our listeners, the words Van Westendorp, uh, Google those, look those up on Wikipedia. Wikipedia has a really big page on that. Uh, it'll give you a feeling for what that looks like and how to do it. Um, yeah. Now, I think be- his first name is Peter as well, like mine. So he's, he's definitely a good guy. Was it really? I didn't know that. Uh, I'm not really. I, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that was done in the 50s or the yeah. 60s, a long time ago. Yeah, it, it has some limitations, right? But But I think, again, this is partly why... Uh, it's, it, you know, we've added some of our own, again, IP to it, but it's, it's a good way to start to, to get, to get some ranges of pricing. There are some, there are some sort of caveats to this, right? If you have a product out there that is, that you think is exceptionally expensive, right? If you're selling a really large enterprise piece of software or product and you need to take that customer or that prospect through a, a demo and a free trial that's going to go on for six months, Van Westendorp or this type of model may not be the best because likely you're going to get numbers that are incredibly all over the place. If you have a little bit more, what I would consider maybe, you know, five figures and under as something that you're anticipating, it, it probably works pretty well in, in that world. 
Yeah, I think the, the, uh, there are two big problems with Van Westendorp um, that I see. One is, are you able to articulate the value of the product clearly enough to the customer or to the yep. respondent so that they know how to answer the question? And then the other one that always bothers me is I don't know what they're comparing me to. If I have a competitor out there, I don't know if they're comparing me to some really inexpensive competitor or to some really expensive competitor or no competition at all. And, and so that often makes it challenging to, for me to interpret those results. Yeah, I think you, you, hit, you hit one of those caveats right on the head. And I, and I think this is, you know, this, this goes into what, what I think my father always used to drill into me as a kid, which is measure twice, cut once. So the, the preparation and setting up an experiment to ask these questions is really important. So it's, you know, unless, you know, everybody understands what a piece of pizza is, right? But if you're selling a, you know, somewhat of a complex subscription or, you know, complex anything, doesn't really matter what it is, you really want to make sure that you, you educate that prospect or that survey taker, frankly, to, you know, what is, what is the product? Why is it special? Where you think the value is so they can answer those questions appropriately. The, the one benefit you talked about competitors a second ago, we do see that, you know, we, we shy away from purely competitive based pricing because you don't necessarily want to assume that your competitor got their price right and sort of take, take that knowledge and apply it to your pricing. Van Westendorp should create some, you know, reduce, or just, I should say, it should reduce some of the inherent bias that your, these prospects or these folks that you want to take the survey have when it comes to your competition, unless you are a little bit more of a commoditized product, right? If you're selling a CRM, well, there are a lot of CRMs out there that you can compare to. So it, it's a little tricky there, but I think if you're a, you know, if you're disrupting an industry or you think you have a product that's disruptive or there's not a lot of folks out there in the market that are using this, then, then it's a, it's a decent tool for that reason. Yeah, I, th I think it's a reasonable tool in, in a lot of ways. Instead of beating up Van Westendorp for a second, let me switch topics because there's sure. another chart that you guys often put up and I want to know where the data comes from, if you don't mind. And this is what you guys call your value matrix. Mm -hmm. um, and so you have, high va you have value versus willingness to pay as the two axes. Yeah, so, so this is sort of like a, what I, I guess I'd consider like a classic two by two matrix on some level. It, it's not super complex. There's, there's maybe a couple ways for me to set this up, but the easiest way to think about this is we are essentially bifurcating the willingness to pay data that we collect along with what we call relative preference data. Relative preference data is for us, and I think for Mark, for, for you, I'm sure you've done, done plenty of this in your past, but for folks at home, if you, when I say relative preference, we're essentially thinking about things as a forced trade-off. And so there are, there are tools out there or, or, or models that you can use that revolve around things called conjoint analysis or even like max diff, they're mm -hmm. called. We have sort of essentially a modified version of the two of those. And so in our world, what we're doing is we're looking at understanding the trade-off between, if we talk about farmers only or match.com, what's most important and what's least important. And we do this on a functionality basis or a feature basis. We do this from a value proposition basis. So when we think about, you know, for, for a dating application, are you, you know, the value proposition, propositions might range from allow you to find love faster or be more efficient at identifying a future partner or find love on the ranch, right? Sort of mm -hmm. value propositions or value statements. Now, those are going to resonate to different people differently. But we want to understand for a particular persona or a, or a population of personas, where does that, you know, where do those value statements make the most sense or which one of them is the most valuable to that population in aggregate? And we'll take that, that, that value statement, let's assume that it's find love faster, and we'll then take that value statement and we'll look at it under essentially the, the idea of where willing, their willingness to pay for that is as well. And that's where we get essentially that two by two matrix that's, that is set up in essentially what I would consider four quadrants. And Patrick talks about this a lot. He's always the, the leader in the show and he'll talk a lot about those four quadrants and where things are identified in or where they are placed in is based on how valuable those features are, be it from a sort of a core standpoint, meaning this is a feature that you have to have in your product, otherwise it's, you're not even at the table, right? It's table stakes, for instance, yep. versus these are features that not a lot of people want, but those that do want it are actually willing to pay handsomely for it. Then you have you know, features that what we would call sort of like add-ons or, or differentiable. These are things that 
you know, I think personally, I think of as like, these are your killer features, right? These are things that nobody else has in the market, right? I often talk about Tesla. Tesla has in certain cars, they have a, they have a mode called the biohazard defense mode. And it's essentially all it is, is, is a, you know, I don't want to, you know, deduce it to something that it's not, but it's, it is a air purification system. It's, it's pretty cool. It's pretty unique. Nobody else has it, but they've really, they've sort of marketed this as a, otherworldly thing and they've done so in such a great job that I think there are people out there that buy a Tesla specifically for the biohazard defense mode. You don't really need it outside of, you know, if you have a lot of pollution in your city or there's, you know, wildfires as there, there have been in California, but, but really this is something that's differentiable and it's unique to them that people are actually going to pay a lot of money for. And then on the flip side, we have something called the, you know, tractable features that nobody wants and no one wants to pay for. Okay. So I'm trying to decipher, let, I just want to go to the low value, high willingness to pay quadrant for a second. Sure. And I think that you could call the Tesla bio protection feature <laughs> one of those. Yep. Okay. And so what you're essentially saying is that it's low value in that if I were to average the entire population, very few people care about it. Some do care. And then it's, it's high willingness to pay because the ones who do care, care a lot. You got it. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. Okay. Got it. Got it. Um, okay. I, I mean, I've seen these before, but I just wasn't sure where that data was coming from. Yeah. So again, we, you know, we're trying to collect data on two different dimensions or two different axes here. And the first is understanding that relative preference of value, right? So that the, the X axis, if you will, if you're looking at, at that, uh, at that matrix is on a scale of negative one to one. And then you have on that Y axis, you have actual willingness to pay or deviation from the median. Yeah. Right. So, and you know, neutral in the middle, and that's how we start to, to place those, uh, place those features within that matrix. Yep. Excellent. Peter, I could do this for an hour or two or three hours with you. This is just a blast. Cool. Um, but we're going to have to start wrapping this up. Uh, but, but first, will you stick around and make a comment on, uh, on the next section about value? Yeah, you got it. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, in episode six, I asked the question, what is value? And many of our listeners gave some pretty awesome answers on the LinkedIn page. Uh, so Christopher Richard Reed gave five answers. I like most of them, but I'm just going to give one of them. Uh, value is what your customer wants and is willing to pay for. I'll, I'll pause for a sec. What do you think of that? Oddly enough or interestingly enough, I, I think on the whole, we'd, I'd probably agree with them, right? I, I'd say it as just the intersection between willingness to pay and, and how much you value a particular product or service. It's sort of tricky to define because it's a bit of a nebulous concept, but it's super important. But I, I think you know, he's pretty, pretty close there. What, what do you think, Mark? I... I liked that one a lot. Yep. He, did, he wasn't the winner, by the way, but I uh. did like it a lot. Um, so here, how about this one? This one is an awesome, but two guys said value is a mystery. <laughs> <laughs> they're right. I mean, like, they're totally right. Uh, and, and human beings are fickle beasts. And so value is, uh, is different for all of us. But I, but I love that. Uh, it's, it is a mystery. Yeah. So uh, value is what a customer sees in your product and decides to go with it and not the competition. That was Sarisha Nukala. I like that. Yeah, I like yeah. that. Yeah, so, so a lot of these are really good. Wilson Haddo, a, a guy who I talk with quite a bit, he said, value is a measure of the benefit the customer perceived they will receive from the adoption of a product. Oh, that's, in, that's an interesting take on it. I like that. What's, what are your thoughts on that one? I thought it was good. I like the fact that he put customer perception yeah. there. Um, I thought that was really good. Uh, I, the only reason I didn't choose that one as my winner was it wasn't pithy enough. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm excited for uh, the winner then. It's going to be two words. <laughs> it's pretty close. It's pretty yeah. close. Uh, so the winner, the one I chose is uh, Uday Haral. And Uday said, value is the consumer's willingness to pay for a product or service. Pretty straightforward. I can't argue with that. And, uh, and I love that definition, willingness to pay. And, and when I start thinking about it, because is it really, doesn't someone value, more, value something more than they're willing to pay for it? But I don't think so. I think if we were thinking about value, it's really what are you willing to pay? And, and think about a, a gold brick for a second, right? Or a, an ounce of gold. You'd probably pay 1300 bucks for an ounce of gold today. That's right. It sounds like the market price. What's the, exactly. Yeah. What's the value? It's 1300 bucks. 
well, how much, what's the value of a 50% chance of winning an ounce of gold? Oof. Right? If you're an economist, you'd say 650 bucks. Mm-hmm. But maybe not, right? Each of us would value risk differently. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's hard. And this was actually the interesting part about looking at farmers only versus match.com because each of us values the idea of perhaps love or romance very differently. And the, the challenge there is, you know, depending on where you are in your, in your life and, and how you view perhaps the idea of marriage is going to swing your, your perception of value and your perception of willingness to pay quite, quite differently. I think unlike a, you know, a gold brick or a bullion putting your finger on how much does, you know, how much is it to find, you know, the man or woman of your dreams, you know, it's, it's going to be different to a lot of different people. And a lot of folks would say that's pretty priceless. So I, it's you know, finding value is hard. I think we can, we as perhaps folks in the industry and, and economists out there and statisticians, statisticians, excuse me, can try to, you know, put formulas around this stuff all day long. At the end of the day, it's, you know, sometimes it's, you know, something's priceless and you got to figure out how to interact with somebody based on, you know, based on the way they, they think in that yeah. regard. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, the reason I like the willingness to pay definition is if you go to farmers only, right, how much am I willing to pay to, at the chance of finding love? Yeah. Right. And, and my value is how much I'd pay. It doesn't mean that's what I'm going to pay because obviously mm-hmm. – your price is probably below my willingness to pay. Yep. So. Yeah. Good product marketing. Peter, thank you so much for your time today. If anyone wants to contact you, how can they do that? Yeah, Mark, thanks. Thanks for having me. It was wonderful chatting with you. The easiest way to, to, to contact me, I'm, I'm just Peter at priceintelligently.com is, uh, is the easiest way. Excellent. We have now made it through episode eight and we have more great guests coming in the future. Uh, If you get value out of the podcast, would you please tell your friends about it and like us on your favorite podcast provider? It'll really help us out. Also, any compliments, suggestions, or questions, you can send directly to me, mark at impactpricing.com. And finally, please join us next week for another episode of Impact Pricing, the season of subscriptions.